to help seek more lost souls. So as we go through that this morning, that's kind of the things that I want you to remember. And third, third is that you are Latin American missions. People just like you from all over the country go and participate on campaigns just like this. People from as far away as California, Oregon, uh, Michigan, and then Kentucky, Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, people from all over the United States come and go with us on campaigns. And so it's not just, you know, those special few, those, you know, three or four that, that you know, really get it. No, it's people just like you, people that sit in pews just like this one every single Sunday that want to make a difference in the Lord's kingdom. So with those three things in mind, I want to tell you a little bit more about Latin American missions. And the best way to do that is to kind of give you a picture of what has happened this last year. This last year, um, we took our, my first campaign was to the country of Nicaragua, but it wasn't a traditional campaign. This was a preacher, future preacher training camp. It's a lot like Lads to Leaders in that we teach young boys how to prepare and deliver sermons, um, how to get up in front of people and read scripture, how to get up in front of people and lead a song, how to even baptize somebody. We took them all out to, the, to this little pool and, and we you know, taught them, you know, this is what you do, this is what you say. You know, a lot of people don't get that kind of training. They just kind of see what's been done in the past and they try to imitate it. Well, that's the kind of thing that we are striving to do in Latin America. There's no other per there's no other group that we know of that's doing this kind of work. That's looking towards the future of the church in these countries and training young men to be leaders in the Lord's church. The young man you see in the picture behind me to the right or to the left is his name is Bismarck. There's not very many pictures of Bismarck. Um, in fact, early on, he was in a, our camp in 2013. Early on in the camp, we noticed really quickly that Bismarck wasn't like the other boys. He kind of stood out. He kind of made you feel a little uncomfortable. It looked like a, a, a little bit of a problem kid. You know, you could just kind of tell he wasn't fitting in. And so we went to the preacher of his home congregation, talked to him, and said, tell us a little bit about Bismarck. He said, well, Bismarck's a new Christian. He hasn't been a Christian for very long. He grew up in the streets, literally. He had no Christian background. He had no family support. He literally was a gang member in this town. He had been around drugs all his life. He had been around violence all his life. And so that gave us a real good picture of who and where Bismarck was from. When we talked uh, about it as a, as a group, we decided, hey, let's give him a little bit extra you know, attention. Let's you know, pair him with one of our counselors. And so throughout the week, Bismarck started growing at a very rapid clip. He started really participating. He got involved in the groups. He became part of the camp in such a genuine way. At the end of the camp, Bismarck gave his sermon and was one of the best ones there. Now, that sounds like a really great success story. And it would be, except for three months later, Bismarck passed away. At the time he was at the camp, and nobody knew it, he had cancer. Nobody knew. He didn't even know it. When he got back home, he gave that same sermon to uh, his home congregation, and shortly thereafter, he started becoming very, very sick. One of the counselors that was there at the camp went to go visit him at his home. At his home. Once he was there and talking with him, one of the things Bismarck said was, the only thing I want is to get better so that I can preach one more time. He never got that opportunity. But that's the kind of young men we get to work with when we're training future ministers. They are the church of tomorrow, but as you can tell, the example of Bismarck, they are today's church. 
They are leaders in today's church. The generation that's going to come up in these countries where we have been targeting these young men to be leaders in the Lord's church, it's going to be an amazing generation to be able to work with. The second campaign I took this year was to the country of Peru, to a little town called Ica. Um, if you follow uh, Kyle Butts, work at all. He's been there to visit a specific museum that has these Ica stones that have carvings of men and dinosaurs in the same carvings. Uh, this is the town where that, those stones are located, where there's a, a, a museum of thousands of these stones that have all kinds of, of drawings of a prehistoric man with dinosaurs. Um, in this town, we had the opportunity to take a medical campaign. This medical campaign was, is all about healing and hope. Whenever you talk about evangelism, it's really a, a, an exercise in healing. Healing for the soul. We use a strategy that Jesus used in that he would heal people's illnesses and sicknesses in order to gain access to their souls. We get to do the same thing through modern medicine. He did it miraculously. We did it through modern medicine. You have no idea the impact it makes on a young mother when she brings her sick child, who she has no access and no means to go to a doctor because if she did go to the doctor, that visit would be for free, but the medicines that she'd have to buy would be so expensive she couldn't afford it. We've literally had mothers tell us, I have to choose between food on the table and medicine for my child. So you have no idea what kind of impact it makes on a young mother when you bring them in, they see the doctor, and you give them medicines for free. It gives them hope. But it also gives them hope for an eternal future. Because their hearts are at a place now that they might listen to what else you might have to say. When we go to these places, sometimes you run into very unique situations. This young lady was 81 years young. She only spoke the language of Quechua, which is native to that area of Peru. It's an interesting exercise to go from an English-speaking teacher sitting down in a Bible study, translating to his English and Spanish-speaking <coughs> translator, then that guy relaying the message to the Spanish to Quechua translator, and then him translating it to the student. Three people having to be used to teach one message to a lady that wants to hear about the one Lord. She was baptized and she is your sister in Christ now. Even though it took us three people using three different languages, it took four hours to teach her. And she loved every minute of it. And now she's your sister in Christ. It's amazing what links we'll go to to spread the word of the Lord. Our third campaign was to El Nicaragua, Nicaragua. I promise you this is probably the hottest place on earth. There may be other places that say they're the hottest, but this really must be the hottest place on earth. Uh, it, whenever, you know, there would come a, a nice breeze through the town, you would just think, oh, finally, there's a breeze. But that breeze felt like a hot hair dryer was blowing on you. It was just a miserably hot whole campaign. But one of the things that happens on, on these campaigns, these types of campaigns, this was also a medical campaign, but it was very rustic. We did not stay in a hotel. We slept under mosquito tents on air mattresses. We uh, uh, really got to a very poor place and offered these med this medical campaign. One of the things that happened is a good friend of mine from Dalton, Georgia, his name was Robert Lester, he's a doctor. Um, he and I grew up together, we went to school together, we were best buds growing up. Well, he is now a doctor and I am now a missionary and both of us think that that's weird 
because we have too many stories about each other growing up. Well, one of the things that happens is that when he, I, I talked to him and we kind of reconnected after a few years of, of you know, not really knowing who, where each other were at. And, and so I was like, hey, why don't you come and go with me to Nicaragua? He said, sure, let's go. And so he came with me on this campaign and it was a rough one for him to be his first, but he had an amazing experience. He got to meet a guy by the name of Victor. Victor had a catastrophic stroke two weeks before we got to meet him. There was really nothing that could be done for him. His family came to the clinic and said, hey, we've got uh, you know, our grandfather that's going, uh, that's, that's very, very sick, he's had a stroke, uh, could you come see him? So Robert went and made a house call in his house um, and for you know, what might pass for a house in El Nicaragua. So he went there and, and he looked him over and he had to tell the family, look, even if he was in the United States, even if he found the best medical care in the world, there is nothing that can be done. The damage is too great. There's sometimes just nothing to be done. With them. And they were grateful to hear that news. They were grateful that they feel like there was really nothing they could do. They were grateful to know that they had done everything they can to make him comfortable. As the week went on, Robert would go once or twice a day to go and visit him and, and you know, just to try to help make him comfortable. Came about Tuesday afternoon and Robert had to tell the family, today's his last day. He will not make it through the night. All the signs are there, he's just not, his body is not strong enough to continue. His, their, Victor's family immediately picked him up and moved him about three doors down. And when we questioned and found out, hey, what's the deal? Why, are, why is he being moved? Uh, they said his final wish was to die in his own house, in his own bed. If we had not been there, they might not have known. He might not have had that final wish granted. And, you know, for Victor, we were there too late. He was not a member of the church. But for his family, they attended every service of every gospel meeting night that we had that entire week. The preacher there tells me that they still study together, that they still are open to hearing more of God's word, and we hope one day soon they will be part of the family of God. The gospel is more powerful than most of us give it credit. The gospel is more powerful than most of us are willing to accept. I contend that if good people will do great things in the name of the Lord, there is nothing that cannot be accomplished. When good people decide to get behind God's plan, anything is possible. One of the things I wanted to, to talk to you about is, is working together over these last several uh, over these last several campaigns, just the campaigns that I took. Now there are three other guys taking campaigns that work with us, and these are just from from what we did. I took four campaigns this year with over 150 team members from the United States. We saw on our medical campaigns 2,500 plus patients. We gave out over 12,000 prescriptions for free. In our children's classes, whether it's VBS during the day or the children's classes at night, we got to sit and teach the Bible to over 600 children. During our Bible studies and door knocking during the days and in the evenings, we saw over 500 people that wanted to sit down and learn more about God's Word. And of those 532 are now your brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's just on my four campaigns. There's a lot to be done. There's a lot going on. I'm really excited about Jonathan coming and joining me uh, in Nicaragua this summer because we're starting something new in Nicaragua this year. Something that I hope is going to be very, very special. What we're going to do is we're really refocusing our efforts in planting new churches. And we've got a new strategy in Nicaragua that we are super excited about because we are looking to get to a place to where we're going to establish a new congregation every single year. 
It's going to be a five-year plan for every single congregation. And what we've done in the past is our strategy has been to train preachers in our preacher training school in Panama. And then we take those preachers and some of those that really did well, we may support them with U.S. dollars for, you know, we want them to plant a church and, and grow it to a place to where it becomes self-supporting. But one of the things we found out about that model is it doesn't really ever get to that accomplished state of self-supporting. It really has a hard time getting that far. Well, one of the things that we want to do is basically using the foundation that we've already built of great people and great ideas, we want to take it to the next level. And that's what we're going to do in Nicaragua. Over five years now, we want to send two guys, not just one, two guys to one location to plant the Lord's church. Over that five years, their job is going to be to make sure that the Lord's church can be sustainable. Not necessarily self-supporting, because as we look into the scriptures, it's not necessarily an absolute biblical model to have a full-time preacher in a place. The church oftentimes did their own service. They made sure that um, the preaching was done. They made sure the teaching was done. They made sure that the Lord's Supper was served and songs were sung. They took care of all of those things with internally inside the congregation. Not a bad thing to have a, a, a great preacher to, to serve as a, a leader and, and a motivator. But it's not necessary. It's not an absolute. So over the course of these five years, we want to plant a, a body of the Lord's church in a town that has no church in it. The, the country or the city that we have identified is Samoto, Nicaragua. It's up near the Nicaraguan, Nicaraguan Honduran border. And what we want to do is over the course of five years, we've got steps that we want to accomplish. In the first year, we want them to establish the congregation, and we're going to support that with a medical team. Generally, on a medical team, we'll see a yield of anywhere between 15 and 35 baptisms over the course of that, that medical campaign especially in a new place. Then we're going to have the local preachers. There's a, a team of about 15 preachers in Nicaragua that work really, really well together. And they oftentimes will get together and they will take campaigns locally just themselves. And so we're going to have those local preachers go and support that medical campaign afterwards with an evangelistic campaign of their own. Then in year two, we're going to go back with another team of, of individuals that are going to just be an evangelistic campaign and, and go and reach out to those folks and, and do a lot of door knocking and show them the love of God uh, through Bible studies. They're also going to do another uh, national, local campaign on that. In year three and four, we're going to be looking for land. We're going to be looking for a land or a building in order to have a, a location of the Lord's church that they will own, that will be their own property. And then in year five, year five, they will prepare the congregation and make sure that everything's ready to go and make sure that the leaders of that congregation are going to really be prepared for when they leave. Now, here's the great thing. When they leave, these two young men are not going to just be, you know, pick up and leave and go to some other city or maybe even some other country. These guys are going to be missionaries to that area. So after five years, they're going to move across town. They're going to establish another congregation that will grow to about 40 or 50 people. And so that if there are any problems or this congregation needs help or encouragement, those guys are just across the same city to be able to come back and help out. In order to kind of make this thing work, we have to understand why Nicaragua is the perfect place to do it. Right now, we talked about those 15 guys. In, of those 15 guys, there are probably four or five that are just outstanding core leaders that will help motivate and keep everything going with the local preachers and help make sure that this is what's going on. Of those great leaders, Almost all of them have been trained in the Bible School of Americas, they, which is our preacher training school in Panama. They are really, really well prepared to do the work of evangelism in Nicaragua.
But the other thing going on for Nicaragua is they, these core guy of preachers have established the Nicaraguan Bible School. Now, this isn't a preacher training school. This is simply a school for members to go and receive more biblical knowledge. They'll have anywhere between 7 and 15 people in their classes each year. It's a two-year program where these people spend from 8 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock in the afternoon every Saturday learning about God's Word. I mean, that's amazing. There's no other country that the locals have gone and taken on this great of a task. No other country that we work with. They have taken on this task, and there is no U.S. money supporting that school. They are doing it 100% on their own. Beyond that, this idea, this whole plan, the reason that it's going to work in Nicaragua is because this plan was developed by Nicaraguans. They're the ones that have thought and into the future and thought, you know, there may come a day when U.S. support may not be possible. There may come a day when, you know, the people that are supporting us, what, what if the congregation that's supporting me has a split or, or there's a factory in that town that shuts down and, and people have to move away and, you know, then my support will come on. They've seen it happen in the past and they know it might happen in the future. And so they want to make sure that the church is stable in Nicaragua. They want to make sure that the church can be independent in Nicaragua. And so they're taking steps to make sure that that happens. But finally, the reason that I think this, is, this will work in Nicaragua is this is a biblical model. Sending two people is very biblical. Jesus did it in Mark chapter 6, Luke chapter 10. When you read the accounts of Paul and his epistles, he's always got somebody with him in Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Philippians, and more. He's always got somebody with him. He's always paired up with someone. Other missionaries that we see, you know, when Barnabas and, and Paul split, Barnabas took John Mark with him. He had, there were always two. It's a biblical model. We have to, we have to lean on the, the wisdom of what those inspired men did. So how are we going to make this happen? How is this going to be possible? So what we want to do is, in, in the past, we've had one congregation supporting one local preacher on a mission field. And that, there's a lot of good that can come from that, but it also creates a single point of failure. And if you know anything about engineering, you want to avoid places that, that would constitute a single point of failure, meaning if this one spot fails, it all comes crashing down. Well, again, what if you know, a factory closes or a church splits or something happens in the local congregation that cuts the support for this, for this local mission work. Bad things happen. Churches close because of stuff like that. Or what if in, in this missionary's life, what if there's, you know, something that happens with him? There's discouragement or his, you know, sin enters into his life in the form of his wife leaving or him being involved in sin or the church just decides, hey, you know, we're not liking the direction he's taking us. There's lots of things that can happen when there's a single point of failure. Well, with two guys, you kind of break up that single point of failure. But also, what we want to do is we want to spread the risk of the local church. We want to make sure that, that it's sustainable. So we're looking for six congregations to support this work for $5,000 a year. Now, $5,000 a year sounds like a lot, but really it's only 10 families saying, hey, I'll give $10 more a week. 10 families giving $10 more a week. It's really $5,200, but that's the easiest way to break it down. With that $5,000, with five or six congregations supporting it, that gives these guys their salary. It makes sure that the medical team has the medicines that they need. It makes sure that the local preachers can do their, um, their evangelistic campaigns. And it also makes sure that there's a building that will be built for that congregation so that after the five years is up, all they have to do is keep the lights on, support their own benevolence work, and make sure that the work of the church locally happens. That's all their responsibility will be. Ultimately, 
probably, I want to get up to five of these missionary teams in Nicaragua so that every single year a new congregation is being born in Nicaragua. That's our goal. That's our plan. When we think about this support strategy for the local congregation, what benefit does it do for a place like Richmond Hills? Well, first of all, every congregation will be involved in evangelism. Your people will be involved in reaching out to the lost. And that means that your members will be involved, even those that can't go. You know, like, you think at times that, well, you know, this is not something that my health will allow me to do. This is not something that my family status will allow me to do. I've got young kids at home or, you know, I've got things that, you know, I just can't get away from. Every single member of your congregation can be involved in this. Let's say you're sending one of your ladies to go and, and teach in our VBS during the day. Every member can get behind that and start helping in the preparation of getting all the materials together that it's going to take whenever you see 150 kids in one afternoon. It takes a lot of preparation. Everybody can be involved in that. You know, your health status might prevent you from going, but you can have, you know, the foresight to help somebody else go, supporting them with, you know, $100, $200, $300, $500 to support somebody else to give. Everybody gets involved. The other thing that, that people like about this plan is there's a lot of accountability. When you have one guy in one location, it's a lonely job to plan a church by yourself. It's a very lonely job. In fact, most of the mission teams that are leaving from the United States for long-term missions are not going as just a one family anymore. Most of them are going in teams. I've got several connections at Freed Harmon University, and most of those people are getting together in groups of at least three families to take, camp, to take on a long-term mission. It's because it's a lonely job. It's hard. It is one of the most difficult things you can do because the devil is going to be on your back every second that you are away from your family, that you're away from your culture, that you're away from what's normal to you. The devil will be on your back. And so, this model creates accountability and support. Accountability from the, from the standpoint of if you're out there by yourself in a location, it's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to, you know, not want to get out of bed. It's easy to say, you know, I'll go and get that tomorrow. But when you've got two guys there and each of you are relying on each other, it creates a level of accountability. It's like, no, I can't miss today. That guy's expecting me. The other thing that happens is there's a lot more accountability in that you've got two guys now that are giving information back to the supporting congregations so that they have a really good picture about what's happening in this local congregation. Finally, the risk is diversified. We talked about that single point of failure with five different congregations going and, and, and giving $5,000 here. That really doesn't hamper the budget so much that even the church can't send people from that congregation to go and be a part of it because that's, that's what we're all about. We want to make sure that you're involved in your mission work. So that's, that's kind of the idea behind what's going on at Latin American Mission. This is the part that Jonathan's going to get to see this summer in Nicaragua. He's going to see the first step. We've got two guys right now that will graduate from our preaching school in Nicaragua. They've taken their finals. They're, they're, they're done with their last class. They will graduate the first weekend in December. And they're ready to go. The great thing is, is they've been participating in the preacher's school, which is very much geared to one man being in one location. But myself and our key contact in Nicaragua, a man by the name of Guillermo, we have been Skyping with those two students every single month to make sure, hey, I know you're being trained this, but as you think about being a minister, and really these two guys are going to be missionaries in their own country, you've got to think different. 
You're going to be planting churches. You're going to be making sure that you're there for about five years. So you got to set it up so when you leave after five years, they're good. That's a different way of thinking and preaching. That's a different way of, of, of helping because now you're not going to be the guy up and preaching every single Sunday. You're getting people and you're saying, hey, we're going to, we're going to create a sermon together and you're going to give it to Sunday. That's training leaders. That's making sure that people are in the right places. And that's a different mindset than being the guy up front in the center every single Sunday. So we have taken it upon ourselves to add training to what these guys are already doing. These two guys, one of them is the number one student in his class. The other is like number three or four out of like 16. So these two guys are really, really well matched. One of them is the outspoken go.